In today's video, we're going to talk about six fairly common 40k rule mistakes to try and clear up some of the less intuitive aspects of the game for newer players. Hello and welcome back to Warspets Tactics, the strategy focused 40k channel where we're all about getting the most out of our miniatures on the tabletop. So as we all know, Warhammer 40k is a fairly complicated game, and despite having a fairly slim line core rule set compared with previous editions, there still are a fair few areas that are just a little bit ambiguous, and honestly aren't all that obvious from just a quick flick through the rulebook. There's just a lot of rules that aren't really all that easy to get, unless you've actually had the experience of playing a fair few games, and have chance to have some of these edge case rules cleared up by more experienced players. In general, it's a common theme for these ones that we're going to be talking about. I feel that they're just generally not worded very well in the core rules, or they've been clarified in FAQs and things, and I think that they're some of the areas that Games Workshop really needs to make more explicit if they want people to be able to play them as they want them to be played, just from a new player reading through their core rules document. So with all that being said, let's take a look at six rules that I've frequently seen trip people up, and try and shed a bit of clarity. So the first one I'd like to talk about is Heroic Intervention. Heroic Intervention is the character rule that allows you to move 3 inches closer to the enemy, and it happens at the end of your opponent's charge phase. It triggers at the end of the opponent's charge phase when one of your characters is within 3 inches of an enemy unit, and it allows your character to move up to 3 inches, provided it finishes up closer to the nearest model. To me it seems like the primary intent of the rule is to allow characters to sort of react to charges on nearby units, so if your opponent's unit charges a unit in your army, and there's a character nearby, then they'll be able to jump in and fight as well. And particularly at the start of 8th, that's how quite a lot of people played it. However, the exact wording, despite it happening in the charge phase, doesn't actually specify that the opponent's unit must have charged for your character to heroic intervene into them. Even if your opponent hadn't moved any models at all in their turn, and your character was less than 3 inches away from one of theirs at the end of the charge phase, even if no charges have been made at all, your character is still allowed to heroically intervene into them. So it basically creates an aura of 3 inches around each character, where they'll be able to jump into close combat if any enemy models happen to be there. This has been clarified by an FAQ in Games Workshop, and they explicitly said that it can happen even if your opponent didn't declare any charges that turn. I'm honestly not sure if it was intended to be worked that way, but it seems to be the way that it works at the moment. In game this can lead to some gotcha moments, particularly when people forget that her characters can heroically intervene, and it can be particularly potent on character vehicles such as Imperial Knights for example. Basically if your opponent has characters, you need to keep your models greater than 3 inches away from them if you don't want them to get heroically intervened into. Another thing to note is that the intervening character doesn't necessarily have to get into close combat, they just need to go further, so they can just use it for a little bit of extra movement if they don't want to be in close combat with said unit. The next one is a clarification on how re-rolls work. Not very intuitive once you start playing, but quite quick to pick up when you have played a few games, particularly against certain units. This one's about the fairly unintuitive way that re-rolls happen in regard to modifiers. Basically, if this Space Marine Tactical Squad took aim at this Crimson Hunter Exarch, they would normally be hitting on threes, but this Crimson Hunter moves fast, so they have minus one to hit it. That means that they'll now be hitting on fours rather than threes. If this Tactical Squad had a rule that allowed them to re-roll failed hit rolls, then in normal circumstances that would be re-rolling all the misses, all the ones and twos. So intuitively, when you're firing at the Crimson Hunter Exarch, they're now hitting on fours, so do you expect to re-roll all ones, twos and threes, as now threes are failed hits. In all honesty, I think that this should be the way that it works, and Games Workshop have made life a little bit needlessly complicated for themselves by having this work the way it does. Basically, the re-rolls are thought to happen before the modifier. So if you have a re-roll that allows you to, say, re-roll failed hits, for these Space Marines you'd only re-roll the 1s and 2s because those are failed hit rolls, and you wouldn't be allowed to re-roll the 3s with this roll because they aren't failed hit rolls yet until the modifier has been applied, and that happens after the re-roll step. To be honest, at the start of 8th edition, I barely met any players who played this right to start with, and it's really not particularly intuitive. The new wording for most characters, or things that allow you to re-roll hit rolls, is that they allow you to re-roll any hit roll, not just failed ones, such as the new wording on the Space Marine Chapter Master option. This means that because you can re-roll any hit roll, you're still allowed to re-roll all of those threes, so it makes the rule a little bit more powerful when you're firing or using anything that has negative to hit modifiers. Next up, I wanted to talk a little bit about fast rolling, particularly when you're grouping together a whole bunch of shots or a whole bunch of saves that really should be rolled individually rather than all at the same time. There's a couple of examples here. Say if these Space Marine Hellblasters on the left wanted to overcharge their plasma guns at these Deathwatch, 
These overcharged plasmas cause the model to die if they roll a 1. Now I've seen a lot of newer players roll all the dice together and then just remove any hell blasters for anyone that you rolled a 1 for. If you're doing this then you're actually doing yourself a massive disservice as it means for every single dice that you roll a 1 of you will lose a hell blaster. The correct way to do it is to roll each individual hell blaster's shots individually. Each one of these hell blasters typically will have two shots in rapid fire range and if you roll them all individually then you might have one hell blaster that rolls two ones in the same shot and that will slay them but they won't be able to die more than once. So you'll have essentially have saved yourself an entire hell blasters dying by rolling them properly. Conversely, I see people doing this quite similarly with saving throws, particularly when they differ within a unit. This unit of Death Watch has one guy with a storm shield in it, meaning that he has a 3 plus invulnerable save. If they take, say, 3 wounds from the Hellblasters, then he's going to be wanting to take the shots. When taking saving throws for your Storm Shield man, you'd have to roll them one at a time, rather than all together, because if you lose the Storm Shield, then you'll lose that saving throw, and the subsequent shots will go onto a model that doesn't have a Storm Shield. If you just rolled all those saving throws all together on the Storm Shield, then you'd actually be gaining potentially quite a lot of durability for the unit, because you might essentially have that Storm Shield saving shots for something when he's already dead. Saving throws essentially happen one at a time as per the core rules, any grouping of them is only done for convenience and most of the time it doesn't matter, but when you have different saving throws like this it absolutely does. Another example is when you have a cover save for the unit, say if you have this unit of death watch, two of them are in cover and the other three aren't, you are absolutely allowed to take those saves one at a time on the units that don't have cover. Say if you had to save 10 shots and the first 3 kill the 3 that are out of cover, then you could have the improved saving throw of being in cover for the remaining 2. Again I see a lot of people just roll all the dice at once without a cover save, which means they're actually losing a fair bit of durability on their units because they could have rolled them individually and pulled the models out of cover, and then take the rest on the models in cover with an improved save. Next up I'd just like to talk generally about the fight phase, which just typically seems to trip quite a lot of people up, both newer and experienced players. The charge and fight phase consists of a very discreet series of actions, and people often just seem to leave one of them out, or not quite do them properly. First of all, in the charge phase you declare a charge, and if you make a successful charge then one model must end its move within one inches of the enemy unit. The rest, provided they go in coherency, can go absolutely wherever they like in the charge phase, so it can be handy for spanning out to get objectives and things. When you come to the fight phase, you nominate one unit to fight, and this can be any unit that's charged, or any unit that's within one inches of the enemy. It's important to note that units that have charged can always be nominated, even if there aren't any enemy models anywhere near them, say another unit has already killed them. This means that say this unit of space marines had charged into these chaos, and by the time they came to fight, one of your other space marine units had already killed all the chaos, they'd still be able to pile in and consolidate, even if there were no other chaos models anywhere near them, as they had already charged that turn. Talking of piling in, it's important to note that piling in is done from one model to the nearest model to that model. You can move up to 3 inches on an individual model basis, and the only stipulation is that you have to move very slightly closer to the nearest model to that one. This can be problematic for large units, particularly when there are things out of combat. In this example, the space marines on the far left of the picture wouldn't be able to consolidate directly towards the chaos space marine squad on the right that they're in combat with. There's a Chaos Lord that's just below them, and even though he isn't in combat with them at all, he's still the closest model, so they would have to move closer to him if they were piling in or consolidating. Sometimes this can be helpful, you might want to tie up other units, but sometimes it can be unhelpful, because these intercessors don't really want to be engaging the Chaos Lord, because he might just kill them all in close combat. It's important to remember to both use the pile in and consolidate every time you have a unit that fights. If you don't remember one or both of these, then it means that you're just robbing yourself of more movement and a lot of new players just forget to do one or both of these steps because they're more focused on rolling the dice for fighting. Fifth on our list out of six is a very quick one, and this one is basically to do with stacking modifiers on the same unit. In school, the usual order of operations is to do multiplication and division before you do addition and subtraction, if all things are equal. But in Warhammer 40k that's exactly reversed. If you have a unit that's benefiting from multiple special rules, and one of them is multiplying and then one is adding, then typically the adding is done first. This is typically because the addition happens to the model's base profile, and then the multiplication is done due to a special weapon such as this Smash Captain's Thunderhammer, which multiplies his base strength profile. 
So for example, if this Blood Angel Smash Captain was near a Sanguinary Priest, who gives him plus 1 strength, he would add the plus 1 strength to his base profile, so to go from strength 4 to strength 5, and then because he's attacking with a Thunder Hammer that's strength times 2, he'd actually be hitting at strength 10. So it's a little bit more powerful than it would be the other way around, where it would only be strength 9 if you'd multiplied first and then added the 1 for the strength. I hope that this has helped clarify a few edge cases in Warhammer 40k. I know that a lot of these aren't the most common situations in the world, but they are some of the most common things that I see people getting wrong in-game. Hopefully Games Workshop will go some way to rectifying these and making them a bit more intuitive as and when they release a new edition of the game. If there's any other common rule mistakes that you see people getting wrong all the time, then please let us know down in the comments. It's always good to share experiences so new players don't fall foul of the same thing. If you've enjoyed the video, feel free to subscribe to Allspets Tactics for more 40k content coming every day. And if you have been enjoying the videos, then any support on the Allspets Tactics Patreon page is really appreciated. All of these videos do take quite a lot of time to make, and the Patreon page is what allows me to focus on this quite so much, as opposed to my real world job. In addition to allowing future videos to happen, you also get to see videos early regularly. Patreons get to vote on polls for what sort of things come next for the channel, and there's the occasional prize draw where I post out some free miniatures. If any of that sounds interesting, or you'd just like to help out, then feel free to check out the link which is in the description below. In any case, a massive thank you for listening, and I'll hope to see you guys next time.